Now I'm going to show you a code which does row height. And this code is uh, no lasers, no electromagnetic pulses. This is the code. Now look at this simplicity of this code. This is how you do row hammer exploits. So memory is an array owned by the attacker. And what I do is I access address number one. This opens the row where address number one is hosted. And then I access address number two. To do this, the, the memory has to close row number one and open row number two. And then I do it again and again and again and again and again. After I do this a bunch of times, I start getting false. Now, uh, it's much more challenging than it appears here. And why is that? So kind of look at this, look at this memory, uh, look at this code, and try to uh, tell me what would happen in practice. I mean, no, I'm assuming that address one really is in the, it's in the row number one and address two is in row number two. What happens when I run this code on a CPU? Exactly, Shai is very correct. Uh, the uh, CPU sees that I'm accessing these two bits of memory a lot. So it's going to cache them in the LLC. So this isn't even going to go into the DRAM. It's all going to be satisfied by the cache. This is one problem. I'll solve it. Uh, so actually, you can solve it. So there is what is called, uh, I can either use prime. I can use prime. So I need to access the memory in a certain pattern. Uh, this is rowhammer.js. Uh, there is a command called cflush. It does the same correctly. This command is uh, saying, just throw this memory out of the cache. So we get it from DRM always. And then the third thing is called uh, non-temporal read, which is a, uh, command which is actually implemented in in the CPU and says get this piece of memory from the DRAM and not from the cache. And why do you use it if you so you can use it to optimize lots of operations if you're kind of going to access a big 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 array of memory and you don't think it to be in the cache because let's say maybe you're accessing it once. So there is an assembly language instruction called a non temporal read. So you can get this to happen in the cache in the DRAM. But uh, let's think of another challenge. What will happen to this code when it's translated into machine language by the compiler? What is the compiler going to do with this? Right, so over the thing correctly, this, this command, this entire block of memory is going to be removed. Why? Because I'm, I'm just accessing memory and I'm not, I'm not writing anything. And I'm not going to be, I'm not using X or Y. And definitely reading from memory isn't supposed to change it, right? So the compiler is going to just throw everything here away. The compiler is also possibly going to see that X and Y do not depend on each other. And it might be reordering them or executing them speculatively, all sorts of messy things. So there is, there is a challenge in getting this actually to happen. So, so one challenge is, getting this code to the DRAM. And I, I showed you something you can do, or you gave me in the chat. I can either do a uh, prime and probe, which is going to be throwing away stuff from the cache so it has to be satisfied in the DRAM. Or I can do a uh, CL flush, which is an explicit operation which throws away parts of the cache. Or I can do a uh, non-temporal access. Uh, the second thing I need to do is actually uh, finding the right addresses. And stuff already commented, we're using virtual memory, the physical layout of, of the chips. Uh, you know, I need to find the row which is on the same chip, uh, but uh, I want to be above the victim and below the victim. So in theory, this is, this is hard, but what happens is that once somebody was able to reverse engineer the mapping of, of memory to chips and rows, it's going to be used by everybody, and somebody was kind enough to reverse engineer. Uh, the paper is called Hammer Time, and you can read it. There is actually a tool in the GitHub repository. You run it on your on your computer, and you discover what is the mapping of uh, addresses to chips and rows. And then it's just a matter of getting the victim to sit in the right place. And now one of the challenges, uh, you need to verify that the attack works. So as I told you, you can't actually read 
from the victim's memory. So you need to be very uh, creative in actually turning this into an exploit. And the challenge is, how do I exploit this? So uh, all sorts of uh, very uh, nice attacks which actually use Rowhammer. And there's a very, very, what you can do is you go to Google Scholar and you see who cites uh, the ISCA 2014 paper. And you can see all sorts of fantastic things you can do with Rowhammer. I'll just give you three very, very uh, quick examples. One of them is called uh, uh, page table entries. So um, you know that when you have virtual memory, uh, uh, you need to store a lookup table which says, okay, this piece of virtual memory goes to this piece of physical memory. And the operating system has a lot of these tables that are called page table entries. And when you access the virtual memory address, the OS or the CPU is helping a lot, is actually going to resolve this to physical address. So if you manage to flip a bit in a page table entry, you can convince the operating system that you can access memory belonging to somebody else. And if you flip a bit of memory and you convince the OS that you can access, listen, a page table entry, then you can actually access all of the bits in memory. So what you do is you manage to flip a bit in one page table entry to convince the OS that you own another page table entry. And once you, you change the memory there, you can actually access the entire memory. Uh, if you understood this by my explanation, then I'm quite surprised. But there, you can read about this. Uh, uh, you can read about this. There is actually Actually, actually, how did this idea come to be? There was an idea of doing a thermal attack, a thermal fault attack on a Java card, which just filled the memory with these page table entries. And once you flip one there, then you can just access the entire memory. So this is one thing you can do. The other thing you can attack is public keys. And this is a very, very nice paper using paper called Flip Feng Shui. What is the idea? Um, the server has uh, a public memory, a public key stored in its uh, database. And you're trying to convince the server that you have the corresponding private key. Yes, you can you can flip it. If you can if you can if you take control over a page table entry, you can edit the memory, you can edit the page table entry, you can make a piece of a virtual memory point anywhere you want in the physical memory. You can change the kernel and you can change the hypervisor. Can change any kind of memory on this. Uh, yes, it's very, very. If you can flip, if you can flip bits in the page table entries, you can do a lot. It's you. If you do it properly, stuff you can get a pointer to anywhere in memory. It's not spectre. Spectre is read only. This is a false attack. You can read anywhere you want in memory. And you can write anywhere you want it. So one of the things you can write is another page table entry. And then you can you can you, you actually have like a pointer which can point anywhere you want in physical memory and read and write through. So you yeah, you can do you have complete control over the OS. You completely own your operating system using R. Yes. Very, very powerful tool. Uh, but what I want to talk about is uh, another kind of attack of flip and shoot. Uh, so the, the server has a public key, and you want to convince the server that you have the corresponding private key. How does the server do this? The server takes a random value, encrypts it under the public key, and sends you this challenge. What do you do? You take your private key, you decrypt the challenge, and you send the plate back to the server. This is a very classical challenge response algorithm using public key. So the server has the public key, and you convince the server that you have the private key because you show the server that you are able to decrypt data encrypted on this public key. So flipping through it, what it does is it hammers this public key. And there's a lot of uh, very, very cool math in that paper, but they show that if you flip a bit in a public key, which is p times q, right? It's very hard to factor. 
you actually get a very, very, uh, a very high probability a composite number which is easier to factor, much easier to factor. So instead of p times q, it's going to be a multiple of many, many, many smaller numbers. And if you have this kind of corrupted public key that you can factor, then you can decrypt anything encrypted under this key. So the flip feng shui attack, you're invited to read about it. What it does is it flips a bit in memory, turning a public key into a very easy to factor public key. And then the server sends the attacker a challenge under this broken public key. And then the client can factor the public key and, and cheat and convince the server that it has a private key. And then, for example, can get authentication, like SSH is using uh, private key authentication this way, so you can break into an SSH server and do all sorts of crazy things. And if you read about the disclosure, so the client doesn't know the broken key. The client only has the public key, but the client can now factor this public key because, because once I flip the bit, it becomes a very, very... Random numbers are usually easy to factor. That's one of the things that they show in the paper. <clears throat> so, yeah, so again, you need to look at the paper. They do what is called the memory massaging. It's called flip feng shui because, you know, feng shui is like the art of, it's actually pronounced feng shui. You like, you need to arrange your room in the proper way so the energies can flow. So what they work in this paper really, really hard is how do you arrange the memory correctly so that the flip will actually uh, get a bit of the private key of the public key and flip it. Uh, you can read the paper and, and they have to tell you it's presented. Uh, yeah, also hip feng shui is, is a very similar thing. Uh, it, the paper is presented by a very, very talented speaker and you can go to the Usenix website and, and, and maybe somebody will be kind enough to paste it here. Uh, yeah, so this is another thing you can do with, uh, with flipping. And the third thing I don't have time to tell you, I really want to talk about uh, DVFS attacks. So this is uh, this is one one crazy attack called Rohammer, and the attacker only needs to read memory. Now I want to show you another kind of attack. Uh, this attack is another kind of false attack. And for this false attack, uh, the attacker needs to be able to run commands with root privileges. So before we justify why does that even make sense, I want to bring you to the world of DVFS. So DVFS is called uh, a, a dynamic voltage and frequency scale. Yeah, how did the attacker verify all of The attacker can, for example, authenticate against an SSH server. Uh, by the way, if you look at the uh, responsible disclosure of uh, the Flick and Shui paper, uh, they told uh, the SSH guys, listen, uh, you can use Rohammer to break into an SSH server using a false attack. What did the SSH guys respond? Out, no, they said it's out of scope. Fault attacks. You don't have fault attacks on servers. It's, it's you know, it's out of scope. You're not supposed to protect against it. Uh, I, that was 2017. I wonder if something had changed. I didn't check. Maybe they were convinced because uh, uh, other, other, um, for example, uh, RSA operations suddenly, even on the cloud server, RSA suddenly protected against fault attacks because Rohammer just brought in the scope. They just took these mitigations which already exist and they added them to more more settings. So stop. So is it more suitable for the hardware designers? Yes, but so what? You have a problem. You need to protect your system. So do it. It's simple to protect. You just need to encrypt and decrypt. Okay. Uh, there are so in the case of these uh, these fault attacks on the private keys, uh, the public keys, you need to save maybe a checksum, like a, a kind of a error correcting uh, me mechanism for the key. If you think the key fails verification, you don't do uh, the key. You can think about solving it. Okay. Uh, but I want to talk about DBFS. 